This is the Linguistics Podcast. Questions or comments can be directed to Twitter at Linguist Chris or on WordPress, http colon slash slash linguistchris.wordpress.com. Hello and welcome to episode three of the Linguistics Podcast. My name is Chris, and today we're going to be talking about phonology. Now, in our last episode, we talked about phonetics, and phonetics was the study of sound segments of language. That concept is sort of expanded upon by phonology. Phonology looks not at the sound segments, but how they go together and how they fit together and the rules that govern their distribution. Okay, uh, So the first sort of crucial aspect of phonology is the concept of a phoneme. Now, one thing I forgot to mention in the phonetics episode is that a sound segment is also called a phone. Okay, uh, when, when linguists talk about different phones, we are talking about different sound segments. Uh, but a phoneme is a concept which is specific to phonology because it, it uh, relies upon uh, how the phone is distributed within words of a given language. Okay, uh, So let me tell you what I mean. For a phone to be considered a phoneme, it needs to be able to carry a difference in meaning. Okay, So if you remember the concept of a minimal pair, that was two words which were uh, separated only by a single sound segment or a single phone. So these would be things like um, uh, tot and pot. right? They're separated only by the p or the t at the beginning. Um, so right off the bat we can tell that uh, uh, p and t are contrastive. That is to say that they're different enough from each other that, that in English they convey a difference in meaning uh, if you have a minimal pair. Um, now, what is it behind a phoneme? Why do we have to have this extra concept of phoneme? Well, as it turns out, it's not as simple as t and p differences. Okay. Now, I mentioned something at the very end of the last podcast, and this, I think, will illuminate the concept of phoneme the best, uh, and that is aspiration. Aspiration, okay? Um, now, I'm going to say two words now, and they're not a minimal pair, uh, but they're still interesting to look at. So those words are stop and top. Okay. Now specifically what we're looking at is the t sound in both of these words. Stop and top. They both have a t. But listen to the relative loudness of that t. And I'm not sure how this, how well this will pick up on a mic, but you might be able to hear it just by listening to the, the t in each word. Stop, top. Stop, top. Now you should be hearing that the t in stop is softer than the t in top. Okay. Now, maybe a better way to demonstrate this uh, on your own is to take a sheet of paper and hold it in front of your mouth and then say those two words. Say stop and top. And what you should notice if you're a native English speaker is that when you say top, the paper moves a lot more than when you say stop. And why is that? Well, as it turns out, there is a phonological rule in English that says if you have a, uh, a a voiceless stop, so that would be t is voiceless and a stop, um, you will, if it's at the beginning of the word, you aspirate that stop. That is, you, you add a little puff of air after the stop. You exacerbate the release of the stop, as it were. So the word top has an aspirated t. And the word stop has an unaspirated T. Why? Well, because the T is no longer at the beginning of the word in stop. It's after the S. Okay. Now, this is a rule that everybody knows subconsciously. Every speaker of English knows subconsciously. Um, you'll notice that you do this whether you know about it or not. Uh, you don't aspirate the T in stop, and you aspirate it in top. It's just how English works. It's one of its phonological rules. Now, I should mention that when I say phonological rules, I'm, of course, talking about rule-based phonology, which is uh, only one aspect of phonology. Um, most of this podcast will, will be covering rule-based phonology, but I will go uh, into an alternative viewpoint of the field at the very end of this podcast. Okay, um, So, what does this have to do with a phoneme? Well, can we make a meaning distinction between a minimal pair which is separated only by aspiration? Well, this is a this is a hard thing to do because we know that generally in English, uh, 
uh, the aspirated sounds only come out at the beginning. So we'd have to have an unaspirated T at the beginning. Now, right off the bat, in rule-based phonology, that breaks the rule. So that would never occur. But we can prove it by simply making up that word. So the word top with an unaspirated T would come out top. Top. Okay? Now, it probably sounds a little funky, but you wouldn't claim that it means differently from the word top. Top 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 it probably sounds a little bit like a d maybe but it's not a d right because if i say the word dop it's definitely different right um so what we can discern then is that top and top the t sounds there unaspirated and aspirated t both belong to the same phoneme why because they represent in english they represent the same sound they're both t's Okay, now the fact that one shows up uh, where the other one does not means that they are in complementary distribution. In other words, you never find a devoiced or voiceless stop at the beginning of a word unaspirated in English. And likewise, you never find an aspirated uh, uh, voiceless stop not at the beginning of the word. Uh, therefore, they are in complementary distribution. One shows up where the other doesn't. Uh, a good analogy for this is Superman and Clark Kent. So if you know about Superman and Clark Kent, you know that uh, one never shows up where you find the other. So where Clark Kent is, Superman is not, and where Superman is, Clark Kent is not. That's sort of uh, like aspirated T and regular T. Okay, uh, Where you have regular T, you can't have aspirated T, and where you have aspirated T, you can't have regular T. Okay. Um, when we have that sort of distribution, that complementary distribution, we say that two sounds are allophones of the same phoneme. Okay, so two concepts, very important. One, phoneme, a sound which in a given language can make a meaning distinction if entered into a minimal pair. And two, allophones. Uh, these make up phonemes. So a phoneme is made up of all of its allophones. Now notice that both aspirated T and regular T are both individual sound segments. They're both phones. But specifically, they're allophones of the same phoneme because they make no, they can make no meaning distinction in English. Okay. Now, with that being said, uh, what exactly constitutes a phoneme and an allophone will vary by language. So there are languages, uh, like Thai, for example, where you can make a meaning distinction in a minimal pair by using an aspirated and unaspirated phone. Uh, uh, the, the unaspirated version of the same phone, I should say. Um, so, uh, and I, I don't know um, uh, any Thai, but I believe that the word bot and pot are two different words in Thai uh, with two different meanings. Um, if somebody does, uh, does know any Thai and that's actually a minimal pair, I'd love to know what the meanings of those words are. Or if I was close, um, let me know what the actual minimal pair there would be. Um, that would be great, and you can either let me know on Twitter or on uh, on WordPress uh, at Linguist Chris. Uh, okay, so that's phonemes and allophones. Okay, um, and we've we've gone over uh, minimal uh, minimal pairs as well. Um, so another important uh, aspect of phonology are phonological operations, and these are things that can happen um, to phones when they are next to each other. Okay, so. It's, it's, it's all well and good to study the segments, the phones themselves, and that's what, what uh, um, phonetics does. Uh, but phonology is interested in what happens to those phones when you put them next to each other. Uh, so we've already seen one such effect um, with the English aspiration rule, where if you have a, a voiceless stop at the beginning of a word, um, then you, you aspirate it uh, in English. But what else can happen to phones that are, that are next to each other or near each other? Well, as it turns out, a lot of things. So one of the things that we're looking at um, when we talk about phones next to each other is called co-articulation. Co-articulation. And this is one thing that I mentioned that we'd talk about uh, in the last podcast. So co-articulation basically is where you make one phone sound like another phone that's near it. Okay. Um, and these effects are best demonstrated with some sort of slangy English. Um, like something like, did you? Did you? So instead of saying did you, we often say did you in quick speech. Did you? Uh, and we still hear it as did you, of course. Uh, in, in fact, it's sort of hard to, to slow it down uh, and, and actually say did you. Uh, 
Uh, but did you is an example of co-articulation. So if we think about what's happening here, we have two words, did and you. The first word ends in d, and the second word starts in y. Y is what's called a glide. It's a palatal glide. It's actually a type of, uh, well, I suppose you could you could call it a vowel in some cases, but uh, glides normally are, are placed into their own category of sounds. Uh, and d, of course, is a voiced stop, a uh, voiced alveolar stop to be specific. So if we have these two sounds, uh, what happens to change that d and the y into a j? Well, if you remember from the last episode, we mentioned that uh, a sound segment, which is a, a mixture of a of a stop and a fricative, is called an affricate. Okay. Um, uh, an example of an affricate is j. Okay, and it turns out what happens is we take the the uh, alveolar feature of the d and the palatal feature of the y and we mix them together into an alveopalatal affricate j j is voiced uh, because both d and y are voiced so we mix the place of articulation and we keep the manner of articulation uh, and we end up with j in quick speech now this is a subconscious process uh, our brain knows that the two words are did you um, but did you uh, simply is easier to pronounce. We're pronouncing one phone in place of two uh, instead of having to pronounce separately two phones which are already pretty close to each other. We simply mix them together into one phone. Uh, that is co-articulation. So another thing that can happen uh, to two sounds near each other um, is called metathesis. So that's where you actually flip two sounds. Um, a classic example of this is uh, in some in some uh, English varieties, the word "ask" is pronounced "ax," um, and it's it's oft uh, joked about by speakers of one dialect onto another. But uh, it is an actual linguistic phenomenon. Uh, it's called metathesis, and it's where two sounds simply switch position. And in fact, um, and this I'm not quite sure about, but I have heard uh, from some other linguists that uh, "ax." Uh, was actually the original Middle English version of the verb ac, uh, ask, uh, and that ask in itself is metathesized version of ax, uh, and that the ax now is simply uh, another uh, metathesis process that occurred on the already metathesized version. Um, whether or not that's true, I'm, I'm not too sure, but it's certainly possible um, with how these things sort of work. Okay, and then we also have... Um, something that's related to co-articulation is called assimilation, and assimilation is also a very, very common phonological process. And what assimilation governs are things like uh, in English, and this most people find this th the most incredible that, that such a complex process uh, all native English speakers know subconsciously. Um, but if you say uh, a word uh, that's called a nonce word, that is a word that doesn't exist, um, and you ask somebody to pluralize it, it turns out that you can pick out a, a very interesting um, phonological process that nobody ever gets wrong in English. Okay, so I'm going to think up three words at random, and these are just nonce words, fake words. And those words are spac, sporn, and spiz. Okay, spac, sporn, and spiz. And uh, as a native English speaker, I'm just going to ask all you listeners to pluralize those. So I have one spac, or I have many blank. I have one sporn, or I have many blank. And I have uh, one spiz, or I have many blank. Now, you'll notice you actually just produced three different plurals based based on the phonology, the, the phonological rule that you know subconsciously. So, spac, plural, we all say spacs. Sporn, plural, we all say sporns. And spiz, plural, we all say spizzes. Okay. So, what are the, what are the plurals? Well, uh, it looks like we have s for spacs, z for sporns, and is for spiz, spizzes. Um, the is I'm going to leave until the next episode, which will be on morphology. I think it's better examined in, in morphology. Um, but let's look at the s and the z. Now, what exactly governs where you use the z versus the s in the plural? Uh, so spacs, uh, 
we used the s because s is voiceless, and uh, k at the end of spac is voiceless. Um, and we used, likewise, we used the z in sporns because n, the uh, voiced nasal, alveolar nasal, uh, is voiced. Uh, so we matched the voicing, uh, and that dictated which ending we use. Now, the endings themselves, the z, s, and is, uh, are called morphemes, and we will get onto that in the next uh, episode of this podcast. But the distribution of those is phonologically motivated, and that's why I mentioned them here. Um, so assimilation is a similar process in which you take one feature and put it onto another sound. Uh, so you could argue um, that uh, having this after a voiceless stop is sort of a form of, of assimilation. Uh, really what we would, we would want is something word medial, so something in the middle of a word that assimilates into something else. Um, so uh, one example would be um, the verb have and have to. So uh, a, a sentence could be something like, uh, I have to go tonight. Notice we don't say I have to go tonight because that v is voiced and the t at the beginning of to is voiceless. And so we, we like to sort of make um, the v voiceless to match the t because it's easier to pronounce that way. So we almost always say I have to go instead of I have to go. Right? Um, just for ease of pronunciation. That, in a nutshell, ease of pronunciation is what sort of motivates all these phonological processes and rules. Right? Um, a lot of them can be can be sort of delimited to to uh, making things easier to say. Okay, so the rule based phonology that we've been talking about so far um, basically means that every the the theory behind it is that every language will have a set of rules which governs uh, where phonemes will be and what allophone will be realized in what environment. Right. So if you have uh, a a the environment of at the beginning of a word and you have a voiceless stop, uh, the rule in English says you aspirate that stop, and you what's realized is the aspirated variety, the aspirated allophone of that phoneme. Okay. Um, there is another competing theoretical basis for uh, how uh, different forms are realized in different languages, and it's called optimality theory, and I'm only going to sort of gloss over it just to show that there is an alternative to rule-based phonology. Uh, some phonologists sort of scoff at rule-based phonology now. Uh, rule-based phonology has been the traditional way to look at uh, things of this nature, uh, but optimality theory certainly has become a close second uh, in recent years. Um, so optimality theory uh, came originally as a brainchild of uh, Alan Prince and Paul Slo blah, I always get his last name Smolensky. Paul Sloment Smol see there I go again. Paul Smolensky and Alan Prince uh, in 1993, and other people have have worked on it since then, of course. Um, but basically what optimality theory is, is uh, any given language uh, has a set of constraints and a an infinite number of possible inputs. Okay. Now obviously the output that you get is the form that you see in the language. So to go back to our, to our uh, aspiration example, we know that in English we get the word pot with an aspirated p uh, and not the non-aspirated p. Okay, um, so the the a simple constraint we could say would be um, that uh, English prefers uh, to not have an unaspirated sound in that position. Okay, um, and thus we would have both possible inputs, bot and pot, and pot would win out because it had fewer violations. Uh, of the constraints. Okay, so fewer violations, meaning the optimal output has the l uh, least number of violations. Now, that's not to say that it doesn't violate something else, because obviously as you make these sets of constraints uh, larger, uh, you're going to violate one or two or three just to get the optimal outcome. Okay, so 
you could say that pot violates 3, but bot violates 5, and therefore pot is still the optimal outcome, okay? Um, and that's how optimality theory works. It sort of takes any possible input you can think of, uh, and you have uh, constraints uh, which are numerous enough to give you the actual output of that language. And you explain all of these things, all of these uh, what used to be thought of as phonological rules in terms of constraints. And you have a rich enough set of constraints um, to explain all of the differentiation you see in a language. Um, there's been some criticism of optimality theory, namely that it's really not all that different from rule-based phonology. Uh, you're simply sort of flipping the way it's that the rules are applied, if you want to think of it that way. Each constraint would sort of um, coincide with what would be a rule, um, although you end up having more constraints than you would rules because you have constraints uh, for things that really don't apply in that language, and therefore they're, those constraints are ranked lower than other constraints because one of the, the features of optimality theory is that you rank the constraints. So the uh, English would rank um, having an aspirated stop in that position very highly and having, uh, I don't know, a, a nasal in that position quite low, uh, and therefore um, you, you would prefer to have the aspirated stop in that position instead of the nasal. Uh, this is, I mean, this is a, just a very, very brief gloss over of optimality theory. If it sounds a little strange and funky, um, in, in my opinion, it, it sort of is. Um, it's it's an attempt to get away from rule-based phenomena. I'm not sure that it uh, it does so well, but um, if you do want to look further into optimality theory, if it interests you, uh, there's a great book by Rene Kager, uh, or I think it's actually pronounced Kager, um, K-A-G-E-R, uh, and it's in the Cambridge Textbooks and Linguistic Series. It's simply called Optimality Theory, and it's pretty much everything you ever wanted to know about optimality theory. Um... So, uh, that is phonology in a nutshell, uh, both rule-based phonology and optimality theory, sometimes also called OT. Uh, I hope it's been helpful to you. Uh, in the next episode, we'll be talking about morphology. Uh, morphology is the study of uh, the smallest form which can be associated with a meaning. So, um, morphology, if you know your Greek roots, uh, is the study of form. Um, it's, it's in, in linguistics, it's the study of forms which are associated with meanings. You'll note that uh, so far in phonetics and phonology, we have not dealt with segments which can handle their own meaning. Uh, in phonology, we've looked at segments which can deliver a change in meaning across two uh, words in a minimal pair, but the sound t or p in themselves do not carry a meaning. Okay, they're simply building blocks for words. So in the next episode, we'll talk about uh, forms that actually carry meaning and uh, things that can be uh, can be examined with those. So uh, once again, thank you for listening. Um, I'm on Twitter at linguist Chris, and I'm also on WordPress uh, at http colon slash slash linguistchris.wordpress.com. Drop me a line if you get a chance. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, and thanks again. <laughs>